This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and once again, our guest this week is Christopher Thornburg. Let's talk about the tax policies that are being discussed. Yeah. So what's, and what policy change are you most concerned about? Uh, policy and, change where? Well, federal taxes. Federal or state level? Uh, I was thinking federal right now. So capital gains rates going up to... Yeah, I, I'm not fussed. I, I wish they would institute an a economy-wide wealth tax because the top 1% do need to pay more. They just do. Um, they just do. And you're talking about overall wealth. I'm talking about people in the top 1% of wealth. Yeah. And they, they need to be contributing more. I mean, the tax rates for the ultra wealthy in the United States are obnoxiously now low. Um, you know, I, what's, what's the latest outrage, uh, Peter Thiel, the guy who founded PayPal billionaire, uh, he has got a billion dollar Roth IRA. Did you hear about that? No. Yeah. So he, he bought. He bought some very, very, very undervalued company with money through his Roth IRA. He then got that company back on its feet. The value of that stock exploded. And now Peter has got close to, I don't know, a billion dollars in a, in a Roth IRA. Untaxable. Oh, and you're like, what, how, why buy, do we allow these kind of abuses? He'll probably buy something with it in the economy. Well, that's not the point. Well, the, it would kind of the, is the point. He followed. No, all the no, it's it's not the point. The point is, is, is the richest among us are not picking up their share of expenses because what? here's the broader problem I'm having. I don't understand. Let me let's let's land okay. on that for a second. Okay, sure, sure. One half a percent of the households pay forty two percent of California's taxes. That's California. We're talking federal. Okay, well, I'm just talking California at the moment. That's so fine, and that's that's a separate story. Our uh, our our. Yeah. Yeah, and you're talking income taxes, and I'm talking wealth taxes. I, well, I know, but you're trying There's to say, huge difference. in addition to paying 42%, we're now going to tax all of your wealth because you didn't pay enough, even though you paid a half of percent paid 42%. Yeah, but but the richest among us, Bruce, pay way, way more. But I'm sorry, not the richest among us. Everybody pays way more to the federal government than they do the state government. So state government policy isn't the critical issue. Uh, state government policy here is not the critical issue. Okay. So federal federal. Government policy. Okay. Yeah. Does, do you think the top 1% pay the most by far in money? Some do. And, okay. and, and, the, the, and again, you're, keep, you're, 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 you're conflating income taxes with wealth taxes. Well, yeah. I think when you have a wealth tax, I think then you start to think, okay, What's the point? You know, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Come on, Bruce. Really? So, are we really are we really going to sit around and say uh, a billionaire is going to stop working because he might have to pay a half a percent on his billion dollars every year to the federal government? Or he's just going to give up? Oh, would I'm he, just I'm just going to go out? live on an island and do nothing. I don't no, think. Would he, would he move out of the country? Uh, let's say you set a wealth tax to California. Yeah. Just, just say, go back to California and California was talking about creating a wealth tax. Yeah. Yeah. Would, and would by the way, leave it, California it, for that? again, but, but Bruce, again, let's, let's, you're conflating things. Okay. You keep talking about income taxes. Right. And I am talking about wealth taxes. I know. But, I, but let me finish. That's double but taxation. I, okay. Let, let me just say something quick. Okay. Because it's important. All right. To this conversation. Um, look, I support a wealth tax. I don't think it can be done statewide. That's a functional issue. It needs to be done federally. We need a federal tax on wealth. Yes, not state. States can't do it because that's that's too fungible. I agree. That's a mistake. We need a national wealth tax. With that in mind, what I would do is I would substitute a wealth tax for an income tax. I think that's the way to do it because you want to reduce the disincentive to work and that's decreasing the income tax. And of course, at the same time, you make up for that with a wealth tax because technically speaking, because you are taxing a pool 
a stock of cash that's there, it doesn't have incentive effects. Or at least not as strong of an incentive effect. And 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 you shift you shift the tax burden away from people who are working hard to people who are just sitting on giant piles of cash already. That already worked hard. And again, we live in a world where we all benefit from the broad system that is around us. No one made it on their own, Bruce. They all made it in the context of an integrated economy that is run by government. So it's not government versus private markets. Uh, they are all part and parcel. And if you're going to benefit from the private market, by definition, you also have the due to support the public system that you're working with it. I would say most of the people that I know that are in that 1% category have paid an enormous amount of taxes to get there. I'm not arguing that. Just that's, one you're, you're, you're talking absolute and I'm talking relative. Okay. Because while they already paid a lot of money, yes. I would argue two things. A, relative to what they made, they're paying a lower share. We all know the, the story of, of, uh, uh, of Snowball there play, uh, paying let lower taxes than a secretary. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, sorry, Nebraska billionaire. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I, but I'm sure that that, yeah. when you anyway. talk about, you're talking about percentages, okay, you're not talking about dollars. So you're talking about- I'm talking about percentages, which are yeah. the relevant relevant metric here. Right. And, and the other part of that, Bruce, is there's a whole other share of these folks who don't pay anything. And that's where I really start having a problem. Maybe it's less about the level and more about the loopholes. The fact that a billionaire like Peter Thiel is able to have a billion dollars in a Roth IRA is clearly a distortion of a system that distortion needs to be fixed. The fact that a lot of the, I mean, I mean, Trump didn't pay taxes for how many years? Now, mind you, he's under federal indictment, but regardless, um, that, yeah, that, that fact that he didn't pay taxes is a problem in my, my book. It just is. So, you know, I, I, uh, I'll, 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 I see that, that you disagree with me and I appreciate that, but. No, that's okay. That's, but they know what, this is healthy because this is what's missing with many different sides of the ar argument is a reasonable discussion. So that's, right. I think it's healthy. I'm, I don't yeah. get upset at that at all. Um, what about, Okay, well, are you in favor then of changing the rules when people pass away and pass their assets on? Yes. And what would you change that to? I'd have a wealth tax for, I'd have a, I have an estate tax that would take a portion and, and uh, again, move it into the public sphere. Uh, but again, I, I know that the, the, the general inclination is for people to accuse me of being a tax and spend kind of guy. My point here is to build a fairer, better tax system. And we need to tax places that are undertaxed more and tax places that are overtaxed less. You know, a very wise fiscal expert many years ago gave me a very short line that good taxes are low taxes on big bases. And our nation, because of politics, slides towards high taxes on small bases. And that's true in California. It's true at the federal level. We need to take a step back tax again under tax portions of the economy more and pull back on taxes and over tax parts of the economy okay and you and you know and you say well well who is that chris let, let me let me give you let me give you two people in california okay, okay. you got the 35 year old uh uh 35 year olds um they are married let's say they have graduate degrees they're making between them good money but you know they're still paying off their student loans. They haven't really built up a nest egg. Um, they don't have a lot of wealth, right? They're trying to make their way forward. Now go to the next person who's 65, semi-retired, lives in a home that they've owned for 25 years in Newport Beach that's worth $8 million. Now, who are we taxing more of these two couples? The answer is, of course, the younger couple. They get hammered with California's income taxes. They get hammered because they're relatively new buyers of real estate. They're the one paying the freight, despite the fact that they don't have a lot of wealth. 
Whereas that 65 year old in the million dollar house in Newport Beach is not paying a lot in income taxes. They have a phenomenal degree of home equity, which they pay nothing on because of Prop 13. And what you see is here are these two people. One should clearly be carrying more weight than the other. And the tables are completely reversed. The well, people you, who have the least wealth are paying the most in taxes. That's just wrong. No, well, you skip the whole part where the first the sixty some year couple used to be thirty four and have college debt and solved all that on their own. Well, they they didn't actually have college debt, Bruce, and they bought that house at a heck of a lot cheaper. And a lot of that wealth occurred for no other reason other than the fact that they were fortunate to be able to buy a house in 1985 rather than 2005 or 2020. Okay. So, you know, it isn't, it isn't like all that money became because they worked so hard. Hmm. Okay. Well, they had a plan. I'll try one more time. A lot of us who end up with wealth think about what we're doing and coincide our efforts with tax laws. Yes. No not about that. I agree. So you say, okay, I, I mean, I, I'm amazed that you have a $500,000 free taxation when you sell your residence. Mm -hmm. I am too. And That's by the way, what's funny is, is when you think about that Trump tax change that occurred, a lot of sort of long run tax policy effort, efforts actually said Trump did, Trump did um, the Democrats a favor by limiting the state and local tax and interest rate deduction. Because the reality is interest deductions and state and local tax deductions are giveaways to the upper middle class. The group of Americans who most benefit from those tax write-offs are our people who should be paying a little bit more. So yet again, you have a situation by which clearly from any economic standpoint, these were inefficient tax policies. They, they just, they didn't have the kind of small tax on big basis effect that, that as a society we need. Um, anybody who understands longer tax policy said these were bad ideas in the first place. Um, and so Trump went to get rid of them at some level and, and he pushed us in that direction. Now, I, I, I again appreciate that these are popular, but I'm gonna go back to the idea, Bruce, that what is popular in public policy isn't necessarily correct. In fact, I would argue more often than not, policy, if it's popular, it's probably bad policy. <laughs> well, all right, I guess we'll, we're gonna to agree to disagree on some of that for sure. sure, sure. Um, okay, let me ask you a general question then. Do you think in general, does the economy fare better when the government takes a bigger share of the pie? Um, No. Okay. <laughs> and, I, and if there was a lot of, if there, if there was a lot, because you look, you, you wanted, you looked for a, you gave me a, a, a binomial choice there, either yes or no. And that's not a binomial answer. Okay. It's not, and it's unfair. It, it, it really depends on, and where, where you, where your starting place is. Can there be too much government? Hell yeah. Can there be too little government? Hell yeah, it, you got to find the sweet spot. Okay, um, let's talk about inflation. Sure. Because I'm really interested in the future of that. Uh, really, yeah. You should so, be. Yeah. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me modify what you just said. You shouldn't be interested, you should be worried. Okay, yeah. well, yeah. Are there winners and losers in inflation? Now let's, let's go there first. Well, everybody's a little bit of a loser. Um, and it's not that inflation itself is purely bad. Okay. It, it's just that it makes decisions more difficult. Um, it makes, I'm sorry, excuse me. It makes longer run decisions more difficult. Okay. That is, you, you know, you have to, you have to um, factor in the uncertainty because it isn't so much that 6% inflation is the problem. It's the problem that a 6% inflation rate looking ahead is really an inflation rate that runs between four and eight. And if it's 4%, you could be great. 8%, you get your clock cleaned. Well, that's a huge problem. 
Mm-hmm. And so it just makes economic decision making, whether it's buying a house, lending money, giving somebody a raise, it makes all those decisions that much more difficult to make. And, and that inflation premium is a problem for the economy. Okay. What were the elements? Let me ask it this way. The elements that caused inflation in the seventies, are they present now? Yes, they are. Yes. Okay. And there's four of those factors. Um, and to be clear again, I'm not in the mainstream on this conversation. Uh, mainstream forecasts suggest that the kind of inflation we're seeing right now is only transitory. Um, and of course, you're hearing that from, particularly from our, our public officials, Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell, who have been more or less saying inflation, inflammation, don't worry about it. Everything's fine here. Move along, folks. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Okay. Um, n- no, no, you cannot be that blase about it. And, and how is today like the 70s? A couple things. Um, first and foremost, um, we have a lot of money floating around the system. The, the quantitative easing that was put into place by Yellen and Bernanke back then, back at, in post-Great Recession, the beginning of the Great Recession, that money was necessary to offset the problems in the financial system and the collapse in wealth. Correct. In other words, all the money they pumped into the economy more or less balanced things out and money supply growth was basically steady. They did what they needed to do to keep it steady. Okay. We didn't have any of those problems, and yet Powell decided to go ahead and do quantitative easing. So he was using a prescription for a crisis that didn't exist. And as a result of that, the money supply has exploded to a level we've never seen before. We've never seen so much M2 creation in such a short period of time. And overall, the amount of money relative to nominal GDP today is not only insanely higher than it was two years ago, it's higher than it was in the 70s for the first time since the 70s, right? We basically have the, the unit money supply, which is the amount of money to, you know, over the amount of nominal transactions we have has never been higher than it is right now. So nobody can say for sure we're not going to have inflation because we, have, we are in uncharted territories. We just are, okay? That's number one. Number two, and I apologize if this is a little long-winded. Or, you oh, know. no, this is good because I, I, I'd like to get to the bottom of this stuff. Yeah. So um, the, the second issue is, of course, the economy is loaded to the hilt with money. Um, again, going back to the 70s, they were attempting to stimulate an economy that was adjusting to deindustrialization, to change fundamental changes in the oil markets, and they stepped on the gas at a crazy level. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. And in fact, it's even more intense right now because it isn't just the Federal Reserve which is stepping on the gas, but the federal government is engaged in, 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 in fiscal stimulus, $5 trillion in spending, the vast majority of which didn't actually get spent in the, in the short run. The money they spent in terms of PPP loans and the direct checks to people, they gave hundreds of billions of dollars to people whose problem was they couldn't spend money. And of course, what do you do? You pay down debt, you, you put in your bank account. So we have so much liquid cash floating around our economy today that is already spurring an incredible amount of demand. That's the spark that sets off the kindling known as excess money, now, money supply. And what, then- Let me just ask this real quick. Yeah, sure. People didn't necessarily earn that that was a one-time check. So well, how that- it was, well, it was a three-time check. They okay. got three stimulus checks. And forget that, because the real money was in those PPP loans. Okay. That's, that was the real cash injection. I mean, you know, what's funny is, is about, I would always call those stimulus checks a distraction against one of the most regressive stimulus policies we've ever seen in our entire life, which was handing out hundreds of billions of dollars to business owners in the form of PPP loans. Okay. Um, so you think inflation is here to stay or we have to well, keep- Well, it- but I haven't finished because there's a couple okay. other factors involved here, okay, right? Good. Okay. Um, so there's that. Okay. Another spark is expanded federal spending that happened in the 70s. And this time around, we're running into the stimulus bill that Biden wants to push. 
Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, you have a bunch of government officials who seem uh, either intentionally or ignorantly completely uh, at ease with where we are on this conversation. So th those are the recipes. Okay. Government spending, a lot of, lot of aggregate demand, lots of money in the system, and a bunch of government officials who don't think it's a problem. That was where we were in 1975. And that's where we are in 2021. Minus a Paul Volcker. Well, Paul Volcker will show up eventually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, that, he, that, he's, a, he's, he's, he's not a cause, he's an effect. Right. So, so right now, okay, GDP, what, what would be the GDP estimate you have for the year of 2021 total? How much growth, you mean? Yeah, GDP growth. Oh, 8%, I think we're at. It's, it's hard to say. It's a huge number. But remember, we're measuring off a, off a 2020. That's weird because of that, that big down second quarter. Yeah. When we had, the, the last time we had GDP growth like that was 84? Well, again, it's not, it's not a reasonable number. I mean, yes, it's going to be excessive growth. Look, part of that number is the fact that we, are recover we recovered from the pandemic recession in a record short amount of time. This was a phenomenally fast recovery. We're done. We're out. As of second quarter, we're back to long run trend. Now, it was always going to be a rapid recovery. As tragic as this was from a human standpoint, it was always going to be a V. It didn't matter what the government did because natural disasters have short run economic impact on an economy. But they acted as if it was a demand shock. They acted as if it was the Great Recession. And as a result of that, $5 trillion in stimulus, $3 trillion in quantitative easing. This is an economy that was already coming up rapidly and they strapped rockets to it and they set the rockets off. And so over the next year, year and a half, two years, you're going to see an economy that's going to be above trend. We are entering into an overheated economy right now. Do you think we will still retain the interest rate level that we have for the duration of that? No. I think that um, right now, the bond markets are responding to all that liquidity, right? That is to say, they can ignore the potential for inflation. They will ignore the potential for inflation because look, here, here's the reality. I'm a fund. I'm TIAA. I'm, I'm the California you know, teacher's fund. Uh, I'm getting massive amounts of cash and I have to invest it. I have to. That is my job. Mm -hmm. And if there's nothing else to buy, I will buy bonds. And so, yeah, interest rates are low because there's willingness to buy bonds just because I have money and I have to buy something. So that's what's keeping interest rates low. Now, does that situation turn around? Right. Well, the economy is overheating. People are spending. Consumer spending is going to grow like nobody's business over the course of the next year. That's going to take money off the table. At some point in time, you're going to have to have quantitative easing reversed. That taper is going to take cash out of the system. And when all that starts going down, that's when you start to see um, the, the impact of all this. That's when you start to see interest rates rise. Do you, one of the charts that's interesting to me is the velocity of money. So money supply is way up, but the velocity of it still basically like at a 60 year low. Does that change in the next couple of years? It, well, the velocity conversation is kind of the reverse statistic from the unit money supply I was discussing. Okay. So when I say there's a lot of unit money supply, that's the same thing as saying there's low velocity. And when you say the velocity picks up, well, in that equation, that means prices are picking up. And when prices start picking up, that's when unit money supply comes down because it's the same amount of money for a higher nominal transaction volume in the US economy. So those two things are two sides of the same coin, exactly the same argument. The inflation comes from that, from that rebalancing. Okay. Uh, it's out of my field of expertise, some of these things. That's why I like, that's why I like talking to you because I, I'm interested in uh, knowing more about what's to come so well, that's my job at some level well again we try to do the best we can uh, given the uncertainty of well uh, what did yogi bear famously said right forecasting is hard especially the future <laughs> well do you view the real estate industry um going to have a, a 
a reasonably good couple of years then because oh, hell yeah. money to spend. Oh yeah. 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 And I think that the gains we're seeing today are sustainable because again, the fundamentals were very good coming into it and you could see a big increase in prices and the fundamentals are still good. So I think the gains we're seeing now in real estate are absolutely sustainable. Now, they're sustainable now. Could they become unsustainable later? Sure. Saying there's not a bubble now is not saying there's not going to be a bubble. Correct. But at this point in time, I don't feel the numbers we're seeing, as dramatic as they are, in any way, shape, or form represents a bubble. That is to say, unsustainable gains in the market. The other thing about this market, and you touched on it, this is a very healthy market where people borrowed money where they actually qualified. They right. put me down, they left their equity in place. Sure. So there's a huge amount of equity on top of a fixed rate loan. Right. So I, there's some people talking, you know, calling for a giant foreclosure pile coming. Yeah. No. Um, I just don't see that one. Not, not, not a chance. That, okay. That's a zero probability. The other thing that's really interesting is the builders started to build rent to own homes and rent to home tracks. Yeah. Well, a, a new game there is that they get them all rented and they, they bulk sell them to wall street in a package. Yeah. And that the wall street companies buy it for a premium over what it would normally sell for by like 20%, mm -hmm. which has the builder going, well, holy cow, why would I build a house for somebody to live in if I can get a premium profit? and sell a bunch of them at the same time. So that's a new niche. I guess it all depends on what Wall Street's doing with those homes. Are they buying at a 20% premium because they think that they can make money by maybe selling them slower? Maybe, I don't know. Oh, they're just renting them. So they right. cash flow. It's, it's, it's funny, I, now we don't, we get statistics on this, Bruce, um, from the American Community Survey. And I would tell you that from, there was a huge increase in single family rentals from starting in 2008 to about 2011, 2012. And in 2011-12, we had more single family rentals than ever before in the United States as a share of the housing stock. But since then, it's been falling, not rising. And again, 2019 was one of the lowest we'd seen in decades, at least as long as we had had that, that data available to us. Now, if things are reversing right now, then that, those numbers may change when we get more data out of the American Community Survey. But at least from my standpoint, if Wall Street is buying them, somebody else is selling them because the overall number of single family rentals has been falling in the US. Okay. Now again, it's different than what might be happening in 2021. What you might be describing is absolutely something happening right now. I just don't know. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a new toy for for yeah. well, the funds, you know, they raise billions of dollars and there are no foreclosures to buy. So they're they're buying new single family homes. Yeah, maybe. I again I don't I'm not I'm not enough of a privy into the system, but I, I would argue that. Um, ownership rates, overall ownership levels are going up right now in the U.S., not right. going down. Yeah. So, so that seems a little contrary to that, or at least it says that the non-Wall Street single-family rental market is shifting towards ownership. Well, as always, I have enjoyed our conversation. I find it very educational, and I appreciate getting to bat it around with you, even if we land on some points of disagreement. To me, that's how I learn. And me too, Bruce. And me as well. <laughs> So I, I always appreciate um, you coming in. We didn't get you talking enough because you obviously have a lot of insider knowledge of the real estate industry that I can learn from as well. Um, unfortunately, this time I did most of the talking. That's because we haven't talked enough in the last year, Bruce. So. <laughs> well, we'll have to get together and we'll just bat it around. That'll be Absolutely. fun. Absolutely. Okay. All right, Christopher, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Always great to be here, Bruce. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.